Good morning, everybody. I have a quiz for y'all today. If you just look on your seats, you'll find a piece of pen, a piece of paper, and a pencil. Thanks for y'all for the nice look. Uh, as you can tell, I don't actually have a test for y'all today. <laughs> but I do have a few questions for you. By a show of hands, who knows what GMO stands for? Okay, now keep them raised if you know what it means genetically modified organism. Couple hands went up. Okay. <laughs> Now, I want you to imagine all the great things and all the bad things you know about GMOs and give it a personality, give it some characteristics, and personify it. Now, do GMOs look like this? Friendly neighborhood caravan here that goes through the schools and gives everybody all the fruits and veggies that you need and goes and tells everybody they need to brush your teeth twice a day? Or do they look like this? <laughs> Friend of the neighborhood Audrey writes. Well, I'm here to convince you that it actually is a character. And this leads me to my favorite story about genetic modification, golden rice. So half a million children a year in developing countries suffer from curable blindness, uh, weakened immune systems, and weakened immune systems due to a lack of vitamin A, C, and other vital nutrients for basic bodily functions. This is because the majority of what people uh, eat in these countries is rice. Rice is pretty healthy, but it only has carbohydrates, and not those vital vitamins and nutrients I was talking about earlier. So these two researchers, well, these two researchers, Peter Bayer and Ingo Patricius, uh, they noticed this, and they said that this didn't have to happen. They looked at their food, and they looked at the rice plant, and not just the rice grain, and notice that there's something called carotenoids inside the leaves of the rice. And the carotenoids will get carrots and fall leaves their color. But they also have another plus. They have those exact vitamins and nutrients that I talked about earlier. So in this case, the genetic modification didn't even have to require any extra plants or animals. They are just moving around with genes inside the plant. So now, because of this, and their hard work in creating a crop called golden rice, um, it, it gives those people the ability to still eat rice and gives those children an opportunity to have the childhood they deserve with, with being able to see and not being able and not being susceptible to easily curable illnesses. But due to the initial negative in introduction of genetic modification to the world, these children don't have the chance to have those normal childhoods that they deserve. So, do GMOs look like this, or do they look like caravan? I like to compare genetic modification to selective breeding. Over thousands of years, selective breeding has given us the cow, the chicken, and the pig, and brought us all the way from the wolf to the great dane, down to the chihuahua and the lab. The slight difference about genetic modification and selective breeding is that it's more accurate. And so, what do you think we could actually do with genetic modification now? Actual chocolate labs? <laughs> That's the kind of person who's cute. <laughs> when I originally started this talk and talked to people about, uh, about what I was talking about, <laughs> one big question kept coming to me. I thought I knew a lot about genetic modification, but this one question always stumps me. How were GMOs actually created? I had no idea to answer this question. After a bit of research, I found out about the papaya of Hawaii. And this plant is a pretty good uh, example of how most GMOs are created. And I put this process and its creation into five steps. And the first step is to actually have a problem. And in this case, these papaya farms in Hawaii definitely did. Their production capacity had been more than cut in half because this virus called rain spot papaya virus, or PRSV. They tried tons of different ways to get rid of the bugs that transported this virus and the actual virus. They tried tons of insecticides, they used huge nets put over all of the trees so the bugs wouldn't get to, and they even moved to an entirely new island, but the virus still followed. And this is when they had to use their last resort genetic modification, 
Because usually genetic modification is the last resort. Uh, uh, genetic modification is kind of like medication. It takes a long time and a lot of money before any progress or profit is seen. So it's usually last resort. And this is the first step. The second step is actually identifying what solves the problem. So researchers hypothesized that if they put a bit of the virus's, a certain part of the virus's DNA into the papaya, then it would be resistant. Step two, identify what solved the problem. And step three, this is complicated. So you have to get the virus just by itself, and then you have to explode all of them, and clean it all up till it's just genes left. Those thousands upon thousands upon thousands of genes and we only need a small part of that. So they use something called restriction new places to go down all of these genes, look for the little tiny piece that we need. And this had to happen thousands and thousands of times. So a lot of smart people doing a lot of smart things. Step four, and this is going on to my favorite step, is actually inserting the gene. And the papaya was pretty fun. They used something called the gene gun. They put genes on these little, on these little pe 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 pellets and they shot it into the seed, hoping that it will connect with the DNA inside the papaya. The thing about this, and how it sounds, it is not a very precise science. Uh, a lot of the times you just flat out miss the seed, you could destroy it. It couldn't even go, it might not even hit the DNA you can get inside the seed. It might not even be in the right place. In fact, most of the time, the gene might not even be in the right place. And this leads to the fifth part of creating a, a genetic modification is the testing. Because even after you create the seeds, because they create 14 seeds instead of four, you have to test them for years to see if the taste didn't change, also to see if it actually solved the problem we were talking about earlier, and see if it's not allergen free. And after all of this, they still weren't, con they still weren't content with the papaya that they created. It was a slightly different color than when it originally came out. So, they went through the entire step five again, breeding it with other papaya plants, so that it could have the desired color that everybody needed. And now because of this, we can all enjoy the papaya today. This actually, this event actually happened before. Uh, it's called a banana. Our grandparents ate a different kind of banana than us. The banana was bigger and sweeter and just a whole lot better. But because the virus, just like the papaya, we can't try that banana anymore. That's actually why artificial flavoring of bananas is kind of different than now, because it was the, ori uh, the original banana called Gross Michel. So if genetic modification existed then, we could still have that delicious banana that I was talking about earlier. And these two things, the golden rice and the uh, papaya, aren't the only things that genetic modification has given us. Some, uh, some, some genetically modified organisms are created to consume more CO2 than usual in order to combat the greenhouse effect. The Ebola vaccine is even created inside genetic mo genetically modified organisms, and less land is used to produce the same amount of crops. But there are some trade-offs that you have to admit. The two biggest ones are that people have a higher chance of being allergic to genetic modification, genetically modified organisms. And the other one is creating super weeds where the, uh, where the genetic GMO uh, breeds with a native plant to create a super weed that is resistant to the herbicides that the herbicides were created, that the GMOs were created to resist. But these problems are being acknowledged and they're being researched. Um, the most leeway has been in creating super, in the, in preventing super weeds. All that you have to do is just not grow the, the GMOs with, uh, not grow the GMOs in places where there are native species similar to it. And after that, the super weeds, they don't happen anymore because they can't, the GMOs can't interfere with the environment. What I'm trying to tell y'all today is that GMOs have a place in this world. GMOs, they can save those children's visions, vision and give them a place and give them a chance to live a normal life. And they can give us a chance to give more land back to the environment. Thank you.